So it's a pleasure to have Graham Smith from Colorado. He's going to talk to us about uh, multipartite optimized correlation measures and holography. So yeah, thank you, Graham, for uh, giving this talk. So please, can start now. OK, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, it's interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking uh, about this uh, work and other work, and also uh, uh, meeting you, I guess, a little more informally at a group meeting tomorrow. Uh, so uh, the general question uh, that we want to uh, kind of understand something about is uh, uh, how do correlations between, you know, we have holography over here. So we have um, some uh, uh, conformal field theory on the boundary of ADS. And uh, somehow there's a relationship between um, what's going on in the boundary or a description of what goes on in the boundary, or what goes on in the bulk in terms of what goes on in the boundary. And we'd like to understand um, how do correlations between multiple regions um, on the boundary correspond to some kind of geometric properties in the bulk. Um, and sort of more specifically, we're going to take sort of an axiomatic approach to uh, uh, really developing and creating uh, a, a large uh, family of correlation uh, measures and entanglement measures that uh, are sort of well suited to giving rise to some geometric dual. Um, and uh, today, uh, things are going to be pretty simple. Uh, uh, we're going to have a two dimensional uh, uh, conformal field theory on the boundary. And uh, the state that we're going to be looking at is a vacuum. But luckily, there's still lots of correlations uh, in that. And we're going to be able to uh, learn some non trivial things. Uh, about uh, what's the structure of those correlations. Oops. So uh, here is uh, the outline. I basically we'll talk first about some entropy, some basics of uh, of entropies and linear entropic formulas, uh, and then I'll I'll talk about uh, my, my my knowledge of. I should have said at the beginning. I'm I'm sort of a I'm I'm a quantum information theorist interested in um, in high energy uh, stuff uh, and. Uh, I have a professional uh, string theorists also collaborating on this, Oliver DeWolf. I think he's even here. Uh, so, so he's making sure that we don't do anything awful. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you have really detailed sort of uh, questions about, uh, uh, about ADS CFT and stuff like that, I'm going to give you pictures and stuff. If you want math, please talk to Oliver because uh, you're not going to get the math on that from me. Um, Anyway, I'll tell you what I know about holography and surface state correspondence, um, which are going to, well, surface state correspondence is this generalization of holography that we're going to be taking as a, a tool to understand our formulas better, um, or our, uh, our uh, well, basically to evaluate our formulas. And then we'll talk about uh, both bipartite and tripartite um, optimized formulas. Well, what's that? I'll tell you what that is uh, in, in a minute. Uh, and I'll talk about the, the many open questions that we have uh, that we would like to get answers to. So, um, of course, we have some quantum system A. It's going to have a density ma matrix rho A. And the, uh, the entropy of that uh, density matrix is just given by uh, the von Neumann entropy minus trace rho log rho. It's also the, uh, uh, the sort of plain old Shannon entropy of the eigenvalues of rho. And if I have some pure state, psi AB, I can make some reduced state uh, rho A, and the entropy of rho, that reduced state is going to tell us how entangled uh, A and B are. Um, now, for mixed rho AB, so for more complicated states than a, a bipartite pure state, we're going to need something more than just uh, than than just von Neumann entropy. And, um, so, one more thing that we could look at is the mutual information. Um, can I, can I do a, watch this. I'm going to do a poll. Uh, uh, part, uh, no, I can't do polls. I used to, okay, well, fine. Um, I just want, maybe, I wanted to get a sense for like, how many people used mutual information in their research before? I see two, but I only see four people. I'm going to assume half of you. Is that, is that, is that, is that a, I think it's close to hundred percent. <laughs> close to hundred percent, fine, good. Okay, so we have some, I forgot, I, I forgot, of course, when you ask a question, 
Some people just don't answer. Okay, so good. Uh, so the mutual information, of course, is just uh, the sum of the individual entropies minus the joint entropy. Um, and it gets both classical and quantum correlations. So if you evaluate it on a classical state here, you get a, a sort of d-dimensional perfectly correlated classical state, you get log d. If you evaluate it on a d-dimensional Maxwell entangled state, you get two log d. So we'll move on. Um, uh, properties of mutual information that are going to come up later are that it's positive, that's subadditivity, and furthermore, it's monotonic under processing. So if I have uh, three systems and I look at the mutual information between A and BC, the other two, uh, that's always bigger than or equal to the mutual information between uh, A and C. Uh, and this uh, monotonicity is equivalent to strong subadditivity. So you can see that just by writing out uh, this for the formula for mutual information here and here, an entropy of A is gonna cancel and this inequality becomes this inequality, which is what you probably recognize as strong subadditivity and uh, defining conditional mutual information, uh, you can just write it like that. So this whole sum of four terms is conditional mutual information between A and B given C. Um, and uh, the monotonicity of mutual information under local processing is, um, is uh, excuse me. Sorry, it's the, uh, well, we're all working from home. Uh, uh, so um, it's just they're going outside to enjoy the snow. Um, Okay, so uh, this mutual information uh, captures both classical uh, and quantum correlations, uh, like I said before. So um, there are actually lots of correlation measures, right? Mutual information is just one of them. Uh, so let me just, I'm just gonna go through a bunch of them uh, just to give you a flavor for what are the different kinds of uh, correlation uh, and entanglement measures you might be interested in, or you might, be, uh, you might find useful. And I also wanna talk about some of the properties uh, that, uh, that make one more useful than another. So uh, the entanglement, uh, the distillable entanglement is defined in terms of what you can do with a, with, a, with a quantum state. So if you have some rho AB, the distillable entanglement is like how much pure state entanglement can you extract, can Alice and Bob extract from, um, <laughs> from, uh, uh, from the state by doing just local operations and, and sending classical communication back and forth between them. Uh, the entanglement cost you might have seen uh, is really just how much pure state entanglement does it take to make uh, the state, uh, make a state rho AB. Um, so uh, the entanglement of formation is a slight variation on that. You may have seen squashed entanglement, which is a nice um, sort of upper bound for distillable entanglement. You might have seen coherent information, uh, which is maybe let me just define it. It's the entropy of B minus the entropy of AB. It's kind of a funny one because it's not symmetrical. It's really got a directionality to it. Uh, and there are more exotic things that you may not have seen, like the, the amount of common randomness you could extract from a state. Um, the log negativity is a nice one. And the entanglement of purification we'll, uh, we'll uh, see more of uh, later. So ideally, you would like your correlation measure to answer some inf information theoretic question. So the way people talk about this is they say, well, is this an operational quantity? Does it does it answer some question that I, I would like to answer in terms of communication or extracting randomness or something, some kind of protocol you could do? Uh, is this quantity answering a question about a protocol I could do? And the second property that you'd like to have your um, uh, correlation measures, uh, ha uh, I guess, have is that they can be evaluated in some, in, in some uh, well, they, they can be evaluated according to some procedure. There's some there's some maybe even really bad algorithm to figure out what they are. So for example, uh, distillable entanglement, I told you, I gave you a definition of it, uh, but uh, for all but like really simple states, people don't know how to uh, evaluate the distillable entanglement because we don't know what the optimal protocols are for extracting uh, entanglement from mixed states. Um, and this is not like a this is more a rule of thumb than like a, 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 a provable a claim, but for, for having some kind of operational meaning, you probably want to express your correlation measures in terms of entropies. Um, 
So one thing, <clears throat> one uh, sort of nice property that uh, we're going to focus on a lot in this talk is this monotonicity that mutual information had. Um, why do I care so much about it? Well, it means that somehow mutual information is capturing something you can't create locally, right? If mutual information, if you could do some local operation and make uh, mutual information go up, somehow you would say, well, the, uh, if I can make correlations by just acting on my own, maybe what I'm measuring is not correlations at all. Maybe I can take as a definition of a correlation as the stuff you can't make by, by acting alone. You have to uh, uh, act some in some global way in order to generate a correlation. Um, and it also has a nice property that it's expressed as a, a linear combination of entropies. Um, just, I'm going to, there. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, I'm being blocked by my, the image. Okay, so um, the terminology we use for this is we say it's a linear entropic formula. And, and if it's monotonic, as well as being a linear entropic formula, we might call it a correlation measure or a linear entropic correlation measure. So uh, here's a fact. Uh, for, um, for two parties, the mutual information just is the only linear entropic monotone. Okay, well, you can multiply it by some positive number, but otherwise, uh, there are no more. Um, and for three parties, well, you can start measuring correlations between subsets or measuring mutual information between subsets of, of systems, like mutual information between AB or A and BC, if I collect them together. But there are two new quantities that come up. The total correlation, which I'm calling K here, and the dual to total correlation there. And these two, these two new, new quantities together with just mutual information between any pairs of groups of parties give the raise to a cone of correlation measures um, that are, uh, what do I mean, like, uh, uh, that, that are, um, well, both linear combinations of entropies and uh, furthermore uh, are, um, uh, are monotonic under local processing. So uh, a fact, yeah. Um, so for this two-party claim, yeah. Is, yeah. There a, is there a reason why you are not considering entanglement of purification a two-party thing because I think it also obeys this, mon this monotonic property. Oh yeah, it is. Entanglement of purification is definitely monotonic. It's not a linear combination of entropies. It has, this is just a claim about if I just take a linear combination of entropies, I don't do an optimization, uh, what are the things that are monotonic? Um, we'll look at optimized formulas later. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Can I interrupt? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to get some more intuition of what are uh, K and J in your uh, presentations. Okay. okay. Um, so K, uh, well, they're sort of uh, the first one. K especially is is an attempt to really generalize the the formula for. Um, uh, for uh, two-party mutual information. So uh, you can see that uh, if uh, A, B, and C are all independent, uh, then this will cancel out that exact, the, this sum exactly, right? And what you're, what, what you're hoping for is if A and B and C are all more correlated with each other, uh, um, you're gonna get an entropy reduction here be because the, the sort of extra entropy that that B has is already correlated with the other with the other pairs, um, and I can give you even more intuition uh, about this K because um, we have a nice operational understanding of K. It's the amount of noise that you'd have to add to row ABC uh, in order to map it to a product state. So you, there's a way to map it to a product state by injecting exactly K amount uh, K bits of noise, uh, and furthermore, you can't do any better. Uh, so that that gives, I guess, a good understanding of A. J is not as well understood, um, but it is again trying to um, trying to. Um, well, we do know that it only goes to zero when you have a full product state, and it has uh, again this sort of taking away the bigger entropy means that if there are correlations between uh, between A, B, and C, that you kind of are taking away less 
uh, uh, than you added in because of the, the reduced extra information you get by having the, uh, uh, by adding a, a third system. Okay, so what we are considering is uh, uh, two kind of setups where we are considering entanglement entropy for a three system. A uh, case kind of measuring the entanglement entropy of individual systems uh, and uh, J is measuring correlations between two subsystems. Um, it, it's, I think, um, I'm not so sure about the second comment, that's all. Uh, it, it, it is measuring something different, at least. Um, and understanding this J is actually, I mean, it's been around a long time, but we don't have a good a good question that we can ask where the answer is J. It's just kind of this mathematical thing that appears um, and, and looks nice and, and uh, goes in an interesting way with K. Uh, is J, does J follow the similar properties as monotonicity of relative entropy? Um, yeah, uh, does J follow similar properties as monotonicity of relative entropy? Um, it, uh, in the well, monotonicity of relative entropy um, is sufficient to show monotonicity of J um, okay. through strong subadditivity. Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, oh, okay. And uh, just as an aside, you might have seen this I3 quantity where you take all the single body terms and then you subtract all the two body terms and then you add back in the three body term. Um, it has this, this cute presentation in terms of J and K, the, I guess, the nice monotones uh, as just the difference of the two monotones. And uh, this, I guess, illustrates one of the problems or one of the challenges with I3, which is that um, it's not a monotonic uh, object. So it's not measuring something that you can't make locally. So uh, that makes it a bit of a challenge to, uh, to understand I3 in terms of any, any operational uh, uh, interpretation. Okay, so that's uh, entropy basics and linear entropic formulas. Um, now let me uh, say what I'm going to sort of use about holography and surface state correspondence. Uh, so, um, well, the, uh, <laughs> we, we don't have to use a lot, in fact. We're gonna use uh, the Ryu Takianagi formula together with, um, with a sort of generalization of it to, uh, to uh, 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 regions that don't lie on the boundary of uh, um, of, uh, of your uh, ADS. So uh, the idea here is if I have some re if I have some uh, uh, some region on the boundary, uh, and I want to know what its uh, its entropy is, uh, what I have to do is I have to find the minimal surface that closes off that region uh, uh, like this. And then the entropy up to some normalization factor is just given by the area of that surface. Um, so um, we, uh, I, I'm guessing many of you are exceedingly familiar with this, so I won't go too, on too much about it. I'll just I'll also remind you the entanglement wedge is just the region bounded by the Ryu uh, uh, sorry, by the RT surface, and then uh, it's in here. Uh, and the, uh, the feature that I, I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the talk was that uh, even the vacuum is going to be very entangled. Um, you can see that here because uh, you got lots of entropy uh, lying around uh, even, in, uh, even if there's nothing sort of fancy going on uh, in the bulk. Uh, and in fact, we're going to restrict our attention for today uh, to just, just the vacuum. Um, so let's just look at mutual information. Uh, 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 and what the RT formula says about it. Um, there are kind of two regimes. There's, uh, if I have some small regions, A and B, far apart, then the minimal surface closing off the AB system is just gonna be the union of uh, the minimal surfaces closing off the A system and the B system. But eventually, when I uh, end up with, uh, when I grow my systems, I'm gonna end up at a point where uh, the, um, the RT surface is going to uh, switch over to being the one that connects from here to here and from here to there. And when that happens, um, the mutual information 
is just going to be the sum of these lengths minus those lengths. Um, so uh, from this time, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm, th thanks. I'm sorry for the interruption. Uh, I just uh, wanted to ask a qu quick question. Uh, in the Ryu Takanagi formula, are there any other subleading corrections to the area term? Meaning, are there a by 4g newton plus some dot 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 terms? Which yes, do that. meaning I'm <laughs> not talking about the generalized entropy. Uh, I'm considering higher derivative theories of gravity. So, are there terms uh, which are like log of a or anything different in the Ryutaganagi formula? I'm, uh, I'm going to inject myself here. I think we're going to need to let the speaker progress a little bit. This, this is really taking us too far away from uh, okay, okay. where it is. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Don't worry, I can't answer that question. Um, okay, so, uh, uh, oh, okay, so oh, what was the, the point? Uh, uh, the point was just that uh, I, we can understand what the mutual information is doing in terms of what's happening with the RT surfaces. Um, and in, indeed, people know and uh, that uh, uh, states with a cla classical gravity dual satisfy some extra constraints. For example, this I3 is, uh, is negative. Uh, and there's a there's a cone of holographic entropy uh, constraints that's a strict subset of the general quantum entropy cone. Um, the final tool that I'm going to need to use uh, is the surface state correspondence. This I this is the idea that even curves that uh, they don't end on the um, on the boundary can be assigned some boundary state, and you can evaluate some entropy um, for uh, open curves that lie on inside the bulk. Um, so uh, the idea here is that closed convex curves are pure states, and all I have to do if I have some uh, some open curve in uh, in the bulk is just compute what's the minimal uh, area surface closing that curve, and uh, up to this uh, constant, the, that area is just equal to the entropy. Um, it's generalization of ADS CFT certainly, um, and and. To me, the, I mean, the way I think about it is just purely in terms of tensor network models, and it's reasonably well supported for those models. Okay, so now we can go to uh, looking at some uh, some optimized formulas, some I guess some something fancier than the mutual information, um, and uh, maybe I should say why do we care about it being fancier than the mutual information? We want to use it to extract more information about the relationship between what's going on in the boundary and what's going on in the bulk. Graham, can I ask a question about how you're using surface state? Sure. sure. So um, I, I guess Masamichi probably could also answer this question. But like, a, the, the question is, uh, if you're using surface state, and as far as I can tell, all of the best motivation for why surface state is correct is works in um, 1 plus 1 CFTs and 3D gravity. Mm -hmm. um, does this somehow limit your ability to extend your approach to higher dimensions, or is there? There's uh, no limitation. Well, I mean, certainly the conjecture is the, the the conjecture is that it works in all numbers of dimensions, but right. because the conjecture was motivated by, for example, tensor network methods that work best in one plus one. Mm -hmm. um, I guess my question is like, to what like to how strong are we thinking that? Uh, the conjecture is supported in higher dimensional generalization. There is no obstruction talking yeah. about tensor network in higher dimension, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't get the uh, uh, because, I mean, it's a tensor network, and you can show all these inequalities satisfied in general dimension. We're not using anything like the or algebra, anything associated with one, one plus one d. It's just simply tensor network isomorphism, isomorphic in that's I guess I was thinking about it more from the um, like the tensor network perspective, where there are many results that you can show are true rigorously for tensor networks in one plus one, but you can't show are rigorously true in higher dimensions. Like for example, you can show that like uh, the Mara, for example, will find the ground state of one plus one dimensional systems, but I don't think you know that it finds like the ground state in higher dimensional things. And I was wondering if that portion of like the Connection with something that would be relevant or needed in the stuff that. Grant Probably, we see, then. Uh, it's just to form form the conjecture. You don't need any of those, right? I mean, you just have to know like the ADS vacuum, 
is obtained by uh, uh, minimization or not. And uh, anyway, I, I guess we will kind of copy. <laughs> that would be probably content of the talk. You can try mirror network in higher dimension, but it's just much more computationally difficult. That's it. Right. Okay, uh, let's stick to just um, um, just one plus one for now, okay? And then um, uh, uh, really, I think the experts on, well, I, I can come up with conjectures for you uh, and, and proposed correspondences and further and even more uh, quantities that I think are pretty good to look at uh, that uh, are inspired by uh, surface state, uh, but if surface state doesn't hold, we still, I mean, I still think we'll, it would be a good, a good, um, I, I still think these are promising measures to look at, uh, even if we can't um, be as sort of rigorous about what, um, what the relationship, well, basically what the optimizing um, configurations look like. Um, does, does that help? I'm going to say yes. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, um, what we would like to do is to go beyond linear entropic formulas. There's only uh, a, a few of them if you insist on monotonicity. And um, the way to do that is you, if you're given some mixed state rho AB, you consider all purifications of it. Uh, so, I, I take rho AB and I uh, extend it to some little a, little b system. Uh, so that the marginal of rho AB or of that of that new pure state psi is just equal to the uh, the, the original mixed state rho AB, and we refer to the little a little b as extensions and scillas and stuff like that. And then our quantity, our correlation measure, is just going to be well. Let me uh, let me minimize over all extensions. Okay, and this is a very general uh, formula, uh, but we're going to be able to identify some some special cases of the formula that have uh, particularly good properties. Um, so examples of of these uh, uh, optimized can you this again, please. Uh, uh, can you explain this again? Meaning, what is it? Uh, f of alpha a? Oh yes. So f of alpha uh, a b uh, f of alpha a alpha is a vector, and f of alpha is going to be uh, uh, a sum over all. Um, all subsets of all the parties. So a, b, little a, little b, of uh, alpha sub s, entropy of s. So it's really, I'm taking a bunch of, a, a linear combination of all the different entropies uh, of all the collections of systems, and uh, then I'm gonna minimize over, over uh, extensions. And uh, you're calling it ancilla because uh, the system can be in any linear combination? No, no, no. The, the system, uh, the, the state must, uh, must have the, um, the marginal of rho AB and we can extend that to some, uh, to some environment and make a pure state in many, many different ways by splitting up the environment in different ways. And this, e -al uh, this optimization tries to pick out a distinguished splitting of the environment um, that minimizes uh, some linear combination of the entropies. So let me give some examples of this first. So here's one example. The, it's called the entanglement of purification. Um, and in that case, you just take uh, a single term in your linear combination. You take the entropy of big A and little a, and you minimize over, so, uh, so here is the, the general form. And then here's the special case. You just minimize over all extensions of rho AB, the entropy that big A and little a have, right? So, uh, and that actually has a reasonably nice operational uh, meaning. It's the entanglement cost of creating the state rho AB um, if you have only sublinear communication between a Alice and Ball. Another example that you may have seen is the squashed entanglement. You just take the conditional mutual information between A and B, uh, and condition on little a or little b, whichever you like, uh, and minimize over that extension to, uh, uh, of rho a b to little a, little b. Okay. Thanks. Sure. So 
two nice properties of the entanglement of purification and squashed entanglement is that they're monotonic. If you, uh, if you um, trace out some system uh, on the A side, uh, it can only make the entanglement purification or squash entanglement go down. And same thing for B. And um, what we'd like to know is, are there any more? Uh, and what I want to talk about is a way to construct these systematically um, and just get kind of a, uh, well, in two, <laughs> for two parties, it's, it's a couple of extra uh, monotones. And for uh, more parties, it's an awful lot of extra monotones. Um, and uh, here's the strategy. Suppose we have some F alpha. F alpha is this linear combination of entropies that was the conditional mutual information for squashed entanglement and just entropy of big A little a for, uh, for entanglement of purification. And suppose it has the property that if I evaluate F alpha on A, A prime B, little a, little b, it's always bigger than or equal to evaluating the same F alpha, but on a different state where I, I take A prime and I hand it over to little a rather than letting it sit with big A, okay? If that were true, that would mean that there's an extension of rho A B, namely this one, uh, that has the same F, uh, that has the same F alpha value, actually not the same, uh, an F alpha value no larger than the F alpha value of uh, rho A A prime B. And that gives me an extension of this smaller state where I've traced out rho a, uh, the A prime system that gives a lower value uh, for um, the objective function that we're minimizing in the definition of the formula up here. Uh, and that ensures that if I can make sure the star is, is satisfied, then also uh, I will make sure that my formula is monotonic. Okay, so then our goal is to go around and make sure and try to figure out the cases where, or figure out the alphas, the sets of coefficients in this linear combination uh, that give us this, this condition for monotonicity. Of course, we want the same thing for B as well, right? So if there's a B prime here, uh, it should be also the case that uh, uh, putting it over with little b uh, satisfy, uh, little b um, ensures, uh, well, doesn't make the quantity go up. Um, oh, there's another thing we want to do. We want to make sure that our, our correlation measures aren't always minus infinity because they're not very interesting if they are. Um, and you can do this. You go off and you get a cone of alphas. Now, this is a cone of coefficients that we put into our objective functions to give a correlation measure after we've minimized. And uh, this is what you get for two parties. Uh, you get the mutual information. That's one that doesn't depend at all on the, uh, on the extension. You get the entanglement of purification. Uh, you get a new, uh, the squashed entanglement. Sorry, I'm, these are all the, the rays of the cone that I'm talking about. And uh, you get two new things. Uh, the Q correlation, this is uh, this linear combination of entropies, and uh, the R correlation. Uh, and each one of these, if I, mi if I minimize over extensions, uh, they give me uh, they give me a, uh, a now something that's monotonic, and furthermore, I could take some conic combinations of these and um, get some other stuff. But for now, we're just going to look at the rays of the cone uh, because uh, well, those are they, they seem to be the nicest in terms of trying to understand them. Ah, I wanted to mention some properties of EQ and ER. These are the two new correlation measures. The first is that um, they sit nicely between, they both sit nicely between the mutual information between A and B and the minimum entropies of A and B. That's actually true for P, for Q, and for R. Um, this was one of the motivating, um, one of the motivating inequalities that, um, that was used to sort of propose that this entanglement of purification corresponds to the uh, entanglement wedge cross-section. The second thing um, that I wanted to, to, uh, to mention about EQ is that we get a nice or a reasonably nice operational interpretation of EQ um, from this uh, decomposition of the entropy of A into two terms. Um, it's equal to the sum of something called the, uh, the, distillable, the symmetric side channel distillable entanglement from E to A. So uh, I have the state rho AB here. And then I, um, I uh, imagine that Eve, uh, the, holds the environment and she's trying to distill entanglement with Alice. And she has one tool with her. It's 
classical communication from Eve to Alice, but it's just a little bit more. It's something called a symmetric side channel. It's something that you can use to simulate classical communication, but it's a bit fancier. It can, it can, um, it can give Alice, uh, it, it can map, it, basically it, it, it gives Eve access to any isometry that, um, uh, that is symmetric between its output and its environment. Um, anyway, the symmetric side channel assisted one way distillable entanglement um, plus EQ uh, just gives me the entropy of A. And that means Alice's, Alice's entropy, I can sort of split up into two parts. One is the part that has some potential to get entang to extract entanglement with the environment. Uh, and the other part is the stuff that basically even Alice can't extract any entanglement for. So this is sort of the the stuff that they can't they can't turn into entanglement. That's how that's the entropy of Alice's that um, that is kind of stuck. And okay, so that's something uh, nice because it gives us an operational meaning of this EQ. Um, we would like to know what are the holographic duals now of uh, of these uh, quantities. The uh, EP um, uh, there was a, a holographic duel was proposed by by Nguyen et al. and also Takinagi and Yumamoto, um, basically by thinking about tensor networks and quantum information inequalities, specifically uh, these inequalities up here. And um, the idea uh, the idea is well, look, if I have some state on uh, if I have some row AB, I'm going to extend it. Uh, I'm going to purify it to uh, some state, and then we're going to uh, to to uh, to some state, and then I'm going to split up that that purification into something that goes with Alice, and something that goes with Bob. Um, and you can kind of maybe I'll just I can hand wave a little bit. You know, one thing you could do is you could uh, well you have to find something to do with this system and this system. And one thing you could do is just split it up like this. Um, uh, but then the entropy of big A little a would be given by the, the length of this, this red curve. So if you want to make the length of the red curve get smaller and smaller, you want to pull uh, the two endpoints in as far as you can. And you're allowed to pull them in as far uh, as far as the point where uh, pulling them in more would make, uh, to, would make the whole curve that you, the whole um, uh, curve that you create by doing that, the closed curve closing um, A and B, uh, that would make it non-convex. Uh, so you have to stop where uh, where um, uh, where pulling further would make it non-convex, uh, and that that point is exactly where this red curve corresponds to the entanglement wedge cross section of AB, and or sorry the entanglement wedge uh, of AB, and the length of the curve uh, just gives you the cross section of that wedge. So that's um, that's sort of their proposal for what uh, um, for EP being equal to the entanglement wedge cross section. Uh, there are several other proposals for um, what might properly correspond to the entanglement wedge cross section um, if you're trying to evaluate something on the boundary. Um, it's it's likely or possible. Well, no, it's likely that sort of these these all correspond these all coincide for the classical limit. And uh, in order to distinguish between them, you're going to have to go to uh, a limit um, where there are quantum corrections. Now. Uh, what about squashed entanglement, uh, R correlation, and Q correlation? Well, um, the R correlation actually turns out to be the same as uh, um, the entanglement purification, EP, uh, even though it's a different formula, and that's because the mutual information between little a and little b is zero when they lie along a geodesic like that. The, entangle, uh, the EQ is uh, equal to, uh, well, it depends on the entanglement wedge cross-section, but also on some other curves. It's uh, the optimizing points are the same, but uh, it gives you some different information about the geometry. Specifically, it gives you, um, um, it gives you sort of the sum of these vertical curves minus the sum of these uh, horizontal curves. So throughout, anytime something's in red, it'll be negative, and anytime something's in green, it'll be, it'll be positive. Uh, and the squash entanglement does something cute too. Uh, the optimizing, configuration for the squash entanglement is not related to the entanglement wedge cross-section, but instead is given by the, uh, basically, all the, all the points go to the boundary. So it's, it's like a trivial 
uh, it's uh, it's like a trivial uh, purification. The inv e like everything either goes to a little a or everything goes to little b, uh, and that gives you the best value uh, for uh, for the objective function. Okay. So we've covered uh, uh, basics. We've covered uh, what we need to know about holography. We've looked at some bipartite optimized formulas. So now uh, I'd like to show you a few uh, tripartite optimized formulas. Okay, and the, the approach that we're going to take is uh, similar to what I showed you in the bipartite case. Um, we're going to extend some tripartite state row ABC to row ABC, little a, little b, and little c. And to make our lives easier, we're going to look for symmetric uh, tripartite correlation measures. Uh, and therefore, we're going to take symmetric linear combinations of entropies. And we're going to require uh, two features, again, this uh, monotonicity, and um, not being minus infinity all the time. So we get an awful lot of stuff now. Um, we get all the stuff where the optimization basically drops out. So the mu sum of mutual information is between any pairs, this uh, 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 dual total correlation, uh, and the total correlation is, um, is uh, a non-extremal, but still it's in the cone of, uh, of correlation measures. We also get, also get a bunch of optimized things that, that are kind of uh, familiar. So we've got the, uh, the tripart tripartite entanglement of purification. We get uh, generalizations of EQ, ER, squashed entanglement. Uh, and they're all uh, just sums, actually, turns out, of mutual informations and conditional mutual informations. Um, some of them uh, are measuring really genuine entanglement. They vanish on separable states. Um, others are measuring sort of total correlation. Um, they're vanishing only on product states. So uh, this is not something that you should you should you should try to read through. At the moment, it's meant to give you a flavor for the stuff that we find. Basically, um, these are the these are the um, these are the rays of the cone that we found of of objective functions that after minimization uh, uh, over extensions um, give us monotones, all right? So uh, uh, like some of them are kind of, you know, you can see are pretty simple. There's this, that's the entanglement of purification. Uh, some of them are, are quite mysterious and complicated. Like, uh, let me find, where's my favorite one? Um, Well, I don't need to tell you my favorite one. You can see some of these are complicated. And the, the point here is uh, of putting them all as a sum of mutual information and conditional mutual information is that that ensures not only are they non, uh, they don't go off to minus infinity, the objective function we're minimizing uh, is, is non-negative. So um, that, uh, you know, that means that uh, somehow when something, when these correlation measures go to zero, that tells us something um, I guess qualitative about what what happened to uh, what kinds of correlations are sitting uh, in, in the state that we evaluated them on. So let me try to add a little bit of um, structure to this uh, to this mess. Uh, yes, a uh, uh, couple of questions. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, here, please. Okay. The first is that your statement that some of the uh, measure. Uh, is measuring really the full correlation, and some of them is just uh, measuring only uh, quantum piece. Those statements, you're not using RT, uh, Ryutake Anagi, right? Or That's right. You... Okay, so this is a general thing that uh, uh, the state just uh, uh, separable states or fact, you know, the product state, and it just goes to zero. So you did not use RT. It's just general statement. Okay? Yes. Okay, good. So that's the one thing I want to make sure. The second thing is, of course, to con connect to some geometric thing. Okay, so the, uh, what, what's the entanglement of purification correspond to this cross-section of uh, entanglement wedges and so on. Of course, certainly you use RT, Yutaka Yanagi, to discuss those things in, in the previous slide. Otherwise, you can't go to geometry. But even then, you did not use anything other than Yutaka Yanagi. You're not using this two dimension. You're not using uh, uh, this is a vacuum. <laughs> because as long as Yutaka Yanagi holds, then you know, everything you said persists. Is that right? 
Yes. Wait, wait, in, ter in, terms of, um, in terms of monotonicity, right? Oh, a a any of the statements you made so far. I, so I far, didn't... No, 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 yes, so far none of the statements depend um, on, um, on uh, well, actually, the statements I've made about tripartite correlation measures uh, don't depend at all yet on, uh, on any kind of holography. Um, yeah. The statements about bipartite depend on uh, RT formula and surface state in as much as I claimed that I could get the optimizing configuration. Yeah, that's it, right? So I'm just, just uh, RT alone is not enough. You need surface state on top of it in order to push into the ball. That's right. Oh, sorry, say that. You need the surface state correspondence in order to uh, push into the bulk. So, like, oh, yeah, that's, yeah. That, 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 that's what I mean. I mean uh, it's just that, yeah, yes, it's a connection between, yes, yeah, the surface state, yes, sure. That's what I meant. Uh, do it again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe just to make it clear, hi, this is Oliver Graham's collaborator. Um, all of all, some of this work is purely quantum information work, if you like, like this, this list of correlation measures at this point has nothing to do with holography and all of their properties have nothing to do with holography. And it's only when we talk about what they look like as, as proposed holographic duals that will use surface state, ADS3, etc. Yes, I got it. But, but ADS3, I didn't get it. I mean, your, your, your situation is probably more general. I mean, because, well, we haven't shown the pictures yet, but when, when, when Graham shows the pictures, it will be in the vacuum in ADS3. If oh, Graham okay. shows <laughs> In the specific video, yes. Okay, good. Okay, so let's see some pictures. So this is kind of, you know, there are 13, um, there are 13 things here, I think. Let me see. Well, let, I will not count them in front of you. Um, but, uh, uh, one way of organizing these correlation measures, now we are going to move into having something to do with holography, is according to the symmetry of the optimizing purification. So here I'm drawing pictures of, uh, of, of uh, two correlation measures uh, that um, have optim no, that have um, optimizing configurations uh, that have, sorry, that have optimizing configurations uh, where the, the points now the endpoints of little a, little b, and little c uh, correspond uh, to the entanglement wedge cross section. Um, now, how do you get these things? You ask the computer to please evaluate them for you. Uh, so, and you know, you, that uses explicitly uh, um, uh, RT and surface state. Uh, and here on the left, you can see the um, just entanglement of purification. Uh, Generalization, generalization that I mentioned before. And on the right, you can see a tripartite generalization of, of EQ. Um, and I, I want to just point out something funny. So, so remember, uh, the, uh, green car, the green curves come in uh, to our quantity with a plus sign, and the, and the uh, red curves come into our, our quantity with a minus sign. Um, and the thing I wanted to point out that's kind of uh, interesting, it's, and it's kind of it's a little bit parallel to, to what we saw when we looked at mutual information is that uh, as the relevant surfaces uh, to tell us our correlation measure can jump as a function of the size of the region. So you've got sort of slightly smaller regions here on the left and you get a picture like this for our EQ. And then as you uh, increase the size of the regions, you, you get uh, a different looking picture um, with different uh, surfaces contributing uh, different, uh, different weights. Um, uh, for our uh, correlation measure. I should mention that the heavier weights indicate uh, a bigger coefficient. Uh, the coefficients here, I think, I think these double, I think these coefficients here are, are uh, two when, when you have a fatter line there. Um, okay, so uh, you can also Sorry. get the, so yes. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask a kind of specific question. It's okay, if, you can tell me if this is too technical. Um, I guess uh, when Newton and I were working on the multi, Partite generalization of reflected entropy. We found a way to find the entanglement wedge cross section, glue it with like n copies of itself, and make it a single, like a circle that calculates an entanglement entropy of one of the replicated copies. Mm -hmm. I guess my question is if you do the same kind of gluing procedure to generate that sort of thing, 
do these uh, other uh, thickened red and uh, green things that you have also join up in some sort of nice way such that they can also be thought of as the entropy of some subsystem of the replicated system? Uh, um, I, I, I'm going to have to, okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think we okay. attempted that, Ning. We didn't try to see if that would work that. for these. Okay, yeah, it's, it's also okay if this is like way too specific. We don't need to talk about it. Well, we can talk about it, but perhaps not right this second. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Oh, well, okay. So, uh, I don't, because I don't want to keep people uh, past the end of the talk either. Um, uh, okay, so this is a case where kind of the entanglement wedge cross section. Um, seems to be the sort of the relevant thing um, determining the uh, optimizing uh, purification of uh, um, of our formula. But we've uh, uh, there are also other situations um, where, uh, for example, we call this one f sub a one. Um, two of the optimization points I should have said and didn't that um, at the moment what we're talking about is just three regions um, lying symmetrically on the circle. Um, uh, uh, you can do, well, basically the, that's complicated enough for the moment, okay? So we're looking at those, so they're all sitting there symmetrically, but in fact, for FA and others of this sort, uh, the, there are two optimization points that are really off-center. You can see them down here and down there. And one of them is right at, sitting at the center. Um, where the entanglement wedge cross-section point would be. Um, and in this case, you get actually three different pictures um, giving the same value of the objective function, each of these three different pictures. And indeed, each of these three different pictures could be rotated twice more so that there are nine total pictures uh, that give, um, according to these, uh, these uh, green and red lines, um, the same value of the objective function. So, um, the uh, the monotones with this symmetry in the optimal in the optimal points um, actually this equality uh, fixes the optimization points according to this picture here. Uh, it says that uh, this point needs to be such that uh, the red curve up there minus the red curve uh, plus the red curve down there is equal in length to this green curve and that green curve. That's what determines. The, the optimal point um, uh, for this correlation measure. Um, we also have uh, formulas that uh, are optimized for uh, where, where the optimal points have a rotational symmetry, but they're all uh, not, they're all off center. And in that case, you get, again, multiple pictures that give the same value of the objective function. And that equality, that collapse in the value of the objective function is determined uh, by um, a kind of a relationship between the different lengths of the curves um, as I've drawn in this picture here. And again, we fix the uh, location of the optimal points by, um, uh, by insisting on this relationship between, between various lengths. Uh, and uh, this is kind of the, I guess, more refined information about, uh, about what's going on down in the bulk that we're getting by looking at these these more um these more complicated correlation measures we're learning sort of extra information about uh, about the shape of the entanglement wedge by doing this so here here's an example where um we have these five different points for five different correlation measures um these pictures just represent the different correlation measures that we're looking at um and each point corresponds uh, to a different optimal state, and therefore each correlation measure is giving us some slightly different geometric information about uh, the entanglement wedge. Um, oh, that's great. So now we've covered um, tripartite optimizations form, optimization, optimized formulas. Um, I, let me mention a few questions that um, I think uh, uh, are interesting and and uh, I think we would be very interested to to discuss and and try to figure out um, the first is well what are the operational significances this is a totally quantum information question what are the operational significances of these various correlation measures I told you eq 
uh, has this interpretation in terms of the, the sort of the, the, the entropy of Alice that's bound up in a way that Eve can't turn it into entanglement uh, via a particular kind of assistance. Um, uh, all of this has been the vacuum, uh, the pictures I drew, I mean. Uh, so uh, the question is, uh, can we do more general geometries and, and say something kind of understandable, for example, if you just have a black hole in the middle? Um, it's also possible that by taking conic combinations of these um, these um, these rays of our cones, that we get sort of nicer or or better um, uh, correlation measures that I, that uh, extract sort of different information, like that have that have optimizing points that are different from from the ones that we've talked about today, because we have this cone of correlation measures, but each time you fix uh, the set of coefficients that you're going to use, once you optimize, um, you might optimize to a different uh, extension of your state um, for that uh, than, than you do for any of the particular things that you mix together in a conic combination. So you may really extract different information by looking at, uh, at uh, non-extremal uh, correlation measures. Um, there is the question, can we go beyond uh, uh, beyond uh, ADS3, um, you can tell, imagine telling stories about, uh, about uh, you know, the relationships now between surfaces instead of areas of surfaces instead of lengths of curves. You wouldn't have points anymore, but you would have other surfaces. It, would, it, it seems it would get quite complicated, but it may be worth doing if, if there's uh, extra information we can extract about what's happening with the, uh, uh, the entanglement wedge. Um, the other thing that maybe I, I, uh, is, uh, I guess, open is, is there a way we can prove the relations um, that fix our optimal points? The way we arrived at them was we did literally did the optimization, right? And, and to numerical precision in the computer, um, those configurations all have the same values. And furthermore, um, uh, we, <laughs> that means that the points that we get to uh, have to have these, these relationships where you know, certain lengths, certain curve lengths are equal to uh, certain other curve lengths. Uh, it would be nice to be able to look at the objective function and say, hey, the optimal, the optimal configuration is just gonna be the one that gives you this equality between, say, these lengths and those lengths. Um, we 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 uh, we don't have a an angle on that at the moment. And I, I guess the the last thing I want to mention is just it would be nice to have some kind of story about bit threads for um, for um, for these correlation measures that we're developing because, um, um, well, there's a nice story about entanglement of purification and it would be, it would be cool if uh, there was a similar story uh, about these other things. So uh, with that, I want to say thank you and remind you that my collaborators on this are Josh and Oliver, and you can learn about uh, any of this stuff either by asking questions uh, or uh, by taking a look at the, finding more details in the, the two archive uh, postings that I'm mentioning here. So I'll stop sharing. Shall I stop sharing? And then if there are any questions, I could share again if necessary. Well, with that, let's thank the speaker. So any questions? Does anybody want to ask more questions? Yeah, I think I can probably ask one. Um, and it seems like uh, Suppose you have ADS3 and your subregions, you're talking about A, B, C, and so on, are all on the conformal boundary, essentially. Okay, you just, just focus on that kind of standard setting. And then uh, there is a divergence coming from short distance, right? But in mutual information, SA plus SB minus SAB, of course, divergence cancels. So this is a good quantity, it's a finite and well defined. This, but on the other hand, SA itself is not. I mean, you have a short distance. Like that. It looks like all the quantity you came up is a finite, like hmm. as far as I just saw, saw it on, 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 on the uh, screen. But apparently, despite the fact you did not impose that uh, in your, uh, or did you? But, but at least you said it's a linearity plus monotonicity is the only thing you just imposed. Then it came, everything is finite. Is there any, like, is this the kind of theorem you can say that monotonicity is enough to make it uh, uh, finite? Or if that's the case, is that a simple thing or something deeper? I mean, 
the the two party yeah. mutual interest isn't always finite, right? Like if the two regions yeah, yeah. are yeah, yeah, but even three party something as far as I saw it, it just it was quick. Yeah, I mean, if it, I can jump in here, Yasunori, we, we do discuss yeah. this in the paper. It's a great question. Um, and in fact, it is monotonicity that's enough. So if you look to see oh, at the way we impose monotonicity, those exact requirements basically end up either meaning that you don't have a curve going to the boundary at all, as in the case yeah, yeah. of the entanglement of purification, the yes. entanglement edge cross section, yeah. or you have equal numbers of positive and negative curves. Basically, yeah. the, the two ways we find to impose monotonicity turn out to be one of those things. So indeed, they, they all are independent of, uh, of the cutoff. Yeah, that was exactly the question, yeah. I had a question about these uh, extensions of states. Is you said there's like different extensions of states that calculate your different entanglement measures. Yeah. Is is it your current uh, belief that all of these extensions of states are easily embeddable in the CFT state? That they're they're just all states that are defined as different surfaces and the surface state corresponds. Belief. Um, uh, perhaps it's it's our starting point to explore the consequences of that assumption. Um, That's quite restrictive, right? That, that like strongly restricts the Hilbert space of your extensions. And so it now tells you that in the optimization story that you're telling, you don't need to care about Hilbert spaces that are like hilariously big, like the provably optimal way that you can do it for entanglement of purification where you need like a D squared Hilbert space or something to guarantee that you can get the right answer. That somehow holography is much more compressed. Right. And we're, 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 so the best argument I can think of for doing that comes out of this group that we're, I'm giving the talk to, right? It's this Newton Chang paper. Um, and I, I would like to understand what the sort of, what, what are the limitations and like, when does that apply and when doesn't it apply? Uh, but it does appear to apply to many of these things at least. Um, so, uh, another a hack you could choose is define all of these things holographically, right? And then you simply only consider the quantity when optimized over sort of nice states. And uh, then it becomes easier to under, easier to evaluate and understand, perhaps not as easy to connect to some operational thing. Uh, but you might not care about that if what you're after is, is some understanding of, of the geometry rather than, um, like if you're always gonna stick to classical states, it, it might not bother you. Of course, we want to prove as much as we can, but uh, we can't prove everything. I guess another question that I had maybe is just, uh, just um, things that sound similar and are unrelated, but you, you talk about the uh, EQ relationship with the side channel capacity. Mm -hmm. Um, is that this, uh, holographically, is there a good motivation for thinking about that as the same side channel capacity that Pennington and Hayden talk about in their alphabets construction? Because there they also talk about the capacity of some noiseless side channel as something that naturally emerges in their thing. And it would be interesting if like the symmetric side channel that you guys are talking about and these noiseless side channels that naturally emerge in this um, alphabets construction are either the same or related because that would give you another, I guess, holographic lever to talk about defining this EQ quantity in terms of things that, uh, as a difference of two different holographically motivated objects. Can, can you, so this side channel in the alphabets paper, is it, they have access to some noiseless channels, but they have to pay them back and they use it to amortize? Or is it, is it yeah, literally- that's right. Okay, um, there is some connection between these side channels and that kind of channel um, through this Brandau and Oppenheim work from, I don't know, 15 years ago. They, they say, hey, you can understand these symmetric side channels, not in terms of a single isometry, but in terms of two conditions about what has to happen. When the state goes to one person, I have one condition for decoding. When the state goes to the other, I have instead a condition on their ignorance. So, I mean, I hadn't thought about that. Um, 
but it might well okay so it may it may well be I, like it might be better to think about things in terms of this Brandau and Oppenheim um, sort of uh, the, what they call it is the uh, the quantum one time pad thing. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, I, maybe we can talk about this again. Yeah, I'll we'll just write that down. Okay. So, any more questions? Can I ask one? Yeah. Can I ask one? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, I just wanted to get some more intuition about surface state correspondence, which you mentioned. Uh, as far as I knew, uh, this is something, okay, this is something new to me, meaning uh, I haven't learned about uh, surface state correspondence before. So, uh, I just wanted to get some more intuition of where is it coming from. Okay, well, the way I think of it is um, I take fully on board the toy models of, of ADS CFT that involve tensor networks. And uh, I imagine that when I talk about some curve in the bulk, what I'm really doing is I'm sort of inverting the the uh, the perfect tensors that I've got to push down into that curve, um, and the state on the boundary uh, that I have is literally the thing that I get by effectively renormalizing according to the pattern described by the curve. So that that's my naive understanding of it, um, and. Uh, uh, well, if you don't take uh, tensor network models seriously, then it doesn't. Then I, I, I guess there are other reasons too to to that I don't understand to believe this, but it. Uh, my understanding is it is certainly a stronger assumption than simply ADS CFT. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, I had one question that. Uh... Um, I, I don't know, it's just because you, you poked my specific interest. Um, so like you guys talk about this uh, K and J thing as like the tripartite monotones and you note that I3 is the, is like a simple linear combination of K and J. Yeah. Um, yeah. If I were to look at say uh, five partite um, generalizations of K and J, so the monotones that, the entropic monotones that appear for five parties, um, are there also similarly simple linear combinations of them that give the, that have definite sign holographically? Like for example, like there's this probably five party entropy inequality that we found. Um, that's definitely true for all RT things and maybe is true for all holographic states, even time dependent. And so can you form like that entropy combination using linear combinations of generalizations of K and J for five party monotone? Uh, well, okay. Um, so for five parties, uh, we so for for three parties and four parties, we just have the cone of monotones. For five mm -hmm. parties, we have it only more uh, implicitly. We we have the facets, and we weren't able to get the rays because it's too big. Um, I mean, maybe one could get the rays, but um, I mean, we can certainly actually for symmetric one. Ah. For, is the would it be good enough? What is the thing that you're trying to get uh, expressed in terms of monotone symmetric? Well, I mean, I can tell you exactly what it is, and you can tell me if you like it. It's like a the sum of um, cyclic three part three party entropies. Um, so A B C B C D C D E D E A and E A B is greater than or equal to the sum of cyclic two-party entropies plus the five-party entropy A, B, C, D, E. So that feels pretty symmetric to me, but I'm not quite sure what form of symmetry specifically you're talking about. We don't immediately have the answer to that, but it may, it may reduce the size of the cone enough to be able to get the answer. Yeah, 
And and then there are these other ones, that, these other inequalities that are uglier, but maybe not so sufficiently symmetric. I don't know. It depends on what you need. Um, but it, it seems like an interesting direction that maybe like a way of coming up with uh, candidate holographic inequalities is to look at simple combinations of um, non-holographic monotones that are not themselves monotonic, but kind of are as close as possible to monotonic in that they're linear combinations of things that are monotonic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I uh, that yeah, I think I think that's uh, something definitely worth worth thinking about. The the dual the total correlation and the dual total correlation are part of infinite families for any number of parties, and I think w one of them is always entropies of a single party minus the ma the entropy of all parties, and then the other involves the entropies of all parties but one and the entropy of all parties. So as you go above three parties, you start to lose, they don't contain entropies of sort of intermediate numbers of parties anymore. Um, that's sort of the only comment I can throw out at the moment. I haven't thought about the five party case too carefully. Yeah, I mean, I think that that feature is kind of something that you might want because uh, one of the things that is true of these five party inequalities is that they don't contain, they don't contain all of the possible entropies that are available to them. Hmm. And so the fact that some of them are left out naturally in these monotone constructions maybe is something that would be borne out in, mm -hmm. I mean, this is going to be something that's borne out in differences of the monotones. I would suspect that as you go to higher parties, although I haven't checked this, that besides the generalizations of total correlation and dual co total correlation, there are going to be more monotones that involve the intermediate numbers of parties also. Yeah. I can confirm that for four, but... Uh... <laughs> It's it's uh, even for well even for four you get a bunch of stuff that aren't entirely obvious um, what they are, uh, but that doesn't mean we can't yeah. Uh, I'm sorry I'm I shouldn't be trying to surfing the internet looking for my own paper when I'm talking to you I'm sorry about that. Uh, well thank you. Uh, Thank you very much for having me. It's it's been a pleasure and uh, fun to talk. And I'll see you tomorrow then. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank so you very much. Take care of you. Thank you.